Now this week is, um, is Advent Sunday. It's a part of the Advent season when we, when we prepare for the Christmas uh, coming up. Can you believe next week is Christmas Sunday? <laughs> Can you believe next week is Christmas Sunday? You know, I know it's been a very stressful time for many of you. They say statistically two weeks before Christmas, so that would have been December 10th on the, on the Tuesday this week, I believe it was. It's statistically the most stressful time of the year, two weeks before Christmas. So if you just made it over that hump, it should get easier from here. But I don't know about you, but I, do you prepare for Christmas? How do you prepare for Christmas? How do you get ready for Christmas? In my family, we're so busy in this time of year. Normally we don't, uh, here's a confession. I was just sharing this with some fellow pastors last week in another uh, gathering. And they asked, so what do you do before Christmas? I, I, I told them the truth. Usually I don't put up my Christmas tree until about like, New Year's Day, actually. <laughs> about New Year's Day. And then, and then I put up the lights of that, about that time, New Year's, you know, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, when I have a few days off in between Christmas and New Year's. And, and then usually I keep them up since it takes so much hassle to take all the, the boxes from the garage and set up the tree and the lights. I usually keep them up there until uh, the, the rule is until the snow uh, gets out of my, my, my lawn and driveway. So usually it's about Easter. <laughs> so, 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 I, so, I, so I realize it's not easy, is it, to prepare for Christmas? Right? Not easy to get in that Christmas spirit, to think about Christmas, because you're so busy with exams and other things at school so, or work. So I thought since um, many of you students don't have quizzes, enough quizzes in your life, um, I'd, I'd give you a little quiz. I, read, I heard this in the radio this week, and I thought, oh, this is kind of cute. So what do you, how much do you know about Christmas? Okay, here's a little Christmas quiz. You, you, can, you can score yourself and let, you know, let yourself know how, how well you did. First question, which is the name of one of Santa's reindeer? Okay, which is a name? Two, two answers. A, Rudolph. B, Olive. Which is the, which is the name? Okay, if you answered A, you're correct. Okay. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. If you answer B, you're also correct. You know, all of the other reindeer. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. It, it, gets, it, gets, it gets worse. <laughs> According to the Bible, the little drummer boy played for Jesus on his mandolin, A, his drum, B, or none of the above. What's the answer? None of the above, that's right, because the Bible doesn't mention the little drummer boy. Do you know that? <laughs> trick question, trick question. In jolly old England, turkeys were popular for Christmas dinner. To get them to market, turkeys were A, shipped by UPS, B, taught to fly, or C, supplied with little booties made of leather so they could walk. Okay. You know, the answer is actually C. You know, in those days, there was muddy roads, and they made little booties for the turkeys until they walked into the, to the market to keep them from freezing. <laughs> that's, that's the answer. True or false? The book of Hezekiah in the Bible foretells the Messiah's coming. Which prophet was it? True or false? Actually, it's false. Why? Because there's no book of Hezekiah in the Bible. Okay? It's only, it, it, it's, it's, he's a king. Hezekiah was a king, not a, not a book. So. Where are these words found in the, in the Bible? For, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah or Matthew? Isaiah, that's right. Isaiah predicted 700 years before the coming of, the pro- of, of Christ's birth. He was the prophet Isaiah. A prophet Isaiah predicted his coming. By, by the way, do you know that Isaiah's parents were entrepreneurs? They made a little prophet. Uh, <laughs> I told you it was getting worse. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how'd you do? <laughs> how'd you do? If you got zero, the, the, the punishment, you have to clean dishes on Christmas Day. Okay? And if you got more than two, then you got a day off on Christmas. So, no. no, so how did God prepare for the coming Messiah? How did God prepare for the coming Messiah? He prepared by, through several thousand years, through a prophet like Isaiah, predicting that Jesus would come one day, on, and we call it Christmas Day, and that's the Advent genealogy. And I, I bet you you've never heard a sermon on the Advent genealogy. So I'm going to do that for you this morning. Okay? This is my, my goal this morning. I realize most of you, when you read, I read the, the, the Christmas story every year before Christmas, and 
I realize most of you are thinking, man, this is going to be a one boring sermon. <laughs> this is going to be one, oh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know. He's, in, in, in the old King James, I, I read in the King James was, you know, begat so-and-so, he's a father and so-and-so. You know, what does this genealogy mean? You know, I, I love the mystery. To me, genealogies are actually quite interesting. I don't know about you, but I, uh, have you ever gone through Ancestry.ca? You know, have you ever checked out your background? And, and it's very interesting when you look at people's, you know, for most of us, this genealogy is just a bunch of names that are hard to pronounce, right? I'm so glad Daniel did a great job. <laughs> he checked, if you ever, by the way, go to Bible, BibleGateway.com, you can check out the, the way they pronounce it. There's a pronunciation guide there. So, but what do we learn from the genealogy? You know, there's a certain rhythm. You know, if you want to go to sleep <laughs> late at night, you can read the genealogy. There's a certain rhythm. You know, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, was, you know, and there's a certain cadence to that. Uh, by the way, you're wondering why, if you're wondering why the genealogy in Matthew is different from the genealogy in in Luke, Luke three, it's because Matthew goes to the the father of uh, the earthly father of Jesus, Joseph. And Luke goes to the, the, the mother of Jesus, Mary. And so that's why you have a slightly different genealogy. Okay? But the whole point of genealogy, well, one of the main points is to show that Jesus came from David and who came from Abraham. And the point is that God had promised Abraham and David that one day the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, the savior of the world would come through these two men. And so that's why we have the genealogy. And that's why all these so-and-so was a father and so-and-so. But then we get to this, uh, as we read the genealogy, you'll notice that there are four notable exceptions in the story. And that's, I don't have time to go through every single name um, this morning in Matthew. But I wanted to highlight, someone pointed this out to me recently. I thought this would be, uh, this is something I want to share with you. There are four notable exceptions. I don't know, the, four, the four women in the book of Matthew's genealogy. Remember, this is the, the story of the, the genealogy of Matthew is the, is, is, is the father's side, Joseph's side. And you'd think in a Jewish male-centered culture, you'd have just men listed on genealogy. But for some reason, God puts in four women, four exceptions. And I want to look at them this morning and see what we can learn from them. This morning, it's not going to be a heavy... Um, uh, exegetical sermon this morning. I'm not, not going to go into a whole lot of Greek and Hebrew and not a whole lot of reading that you haven't read before. But I want to reflect this morning as we prepare for Advent and prepare for in Advent season for Christmas how God prepared for the coming of His Son through the genealogy and particular four women. Look at verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez and, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Who's Tamar? Solomon, uh, it could be Salmon, but I don't want to call him Salmon. So, Solomon, the father of Boaz, verse 5, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And then verse 6, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. We know her name is Bathsheba. You know, we always include in this Christmas story information about Mary mother of Jesus, information about uh, Elizabeth, the mother of, of John the Baptist, also predicted he'd be coming, right? Uh, and then the story of Anna, the, the, the lady who was in the temple waiting for the coming Messiah when Jesus was presented in the temple. But very few people talk about Tamar, talk about Ruth, or Rahab, or Bathsheba in the context of Christmas. Why? Well, if you were a Jewish person and you knew the background to these women, they weren't the greatest examples in many ways. They were interesting. Tamar, Genesis 38, was from Canaan. She was a, that was a hated enemy of the, of the Jews. So like if today, if you know, you're a Jewish person and, and, you, and you, you know, end up marrying someone from Iran or something, right? <laughs> you can picture that, right? Uh, or, uh, that kind of uh, antagonism. Tamar came from Canaan. She was married to Judah's, uh, one, of the, one of the ancestors, one of the patriarchs, Judah's sons. But both the sons, she married the first son, 
he died, punished by the Lord. Then she married the second son, he died. And the story in Genesis 38 is that Judah then kind of pushed her away for many years, pretended to say, oh, you, you know, you can marry my third son, but he didn't, just didn't work, he, he didn't want him to die too. And the Bible says that what happened was Tamar ends up, um, when she found out Judah was, was going to come to her hometown, she, she dressed up like a prostitute. She went to the red light district of the town. She just seduces her father-in-law. She gets pregnant by him and has his kid. That's Tamar. Can you imagine that? Then there's Rahab. She's in Joshua chapter 2. She was the lady who, who helped the spies when they um, came in to check out the, uh, Jericho. But if you know anything about Rahab's background, what was her, what was her um, uh, occupation? What was her profession? She was a prostitute. She was a prostitute. Now, how many of you have a prostitute in your background? You know, your great, great, great grandmother was a prostitute. If you did have one, how many of you would tell me? <laughs> she was a prostitute. She's also from Canaan, the hated enemies of the Jews. Ruth was also a foreigner. She was from Moab, another country that was an, a traditional enemy of the Jews. Ruth was a poor, penniless foreigner, a nobody in society's eyes. Someone that would be, you know, pushing around uh, a, 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 a shopping cart and talking to herself in downtown Toronto. That's Ruth's background. And then there's Bathsheba. 2 Samuel chapter 11. She was the one that, was, that committed adultery with David, King David. And after that, his life and the kingdom was never the same again. Most of them involved with sexual sin. Of course, it wasn't all their fault. Okay? There's a lot of men involved. And there's a lot of sinful men in this passage as well. But the, I just want to focus on these four women and think about them. They were unclean. They were involved with lies and cover ups and greed and deception. And yet they're named as part of our Savior, our Holy Savior's genealogy. Why? I believe because the genealogy is not just there to talk about the, the literal ancestry of Christ. Not just, not just to prove that Jesus came from Abraham and David, although that is um, one major proof, reason for genealogy. But I believe the reason the genealogy is there because it reminds us again as we read it that our God is a God of grace. And Christ's genealogy is a genealogy of grace. Forgiveness. Mercy. Undeserved mercy. The Christmas genealogy reminds us that our Savior had a very earthly pedigree. That he had skeletons in his closet even though he's without sin, even though he's sinless, the Son of God. And, and, we, and, and look, you look at these, um, you, read the, you, read the, uh, you read the Christmas cards, you look at the Christmas cards, you sing the songs, and you have this picture of this beautiful little baby lying in swaddling clothes in a manger. Okay? What's a manger? A nice little crib? No, no, it's, a, it's an eating stall. The manger comes from the French word manger, which means to eat, right? It's an eating stall. And Jesus, even though he's the son of God, entered into humanity and he sweated like us. The little baby Jesus had to, be, had to have his diapers changed. <laughs> he was real. He was human. And he came through this kind of pedigree. It smelled in that, in that, uh, uh, you know, the, the stable. There was straw in the air. There was the smell of cattle. And, and that sort of reminds us that, and the genealogy reminds us that Christ came from a very earthly pedigree. He had people like these four women in his background. Yet he was God. Yet Christ came, even though he's perfect and holy, he came and he decided to be human, just like us, yet without sin. Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, later on in our text the chapter we read this morning. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet, which is Isaiah uh, 7 verse 14. The virgin will conceive and, bear, and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God became flesh. It's called the incarnation. That's, and if you're new to the church, if you're new to Christianity, that's what Christmas is all about. 
God coming down in the flesh, humbling himself, becoming human. The author uh, Leif Anderson writes this about something he experienced several years ago. I was visiting Manila, he says, in the Philippines, and I was taken of all places to the Manila garbage dump, and I saw something beyond belief there. Tens of thousands of people, I think they call this Smoky Mountain, by the way, uh, in, in, in Manila, tens of thousands of people make their home in, on this dump. They've constructed shacks out of the things other people have thrown away. And they send their children out every evening, every morning, to scavenge for food out of other people's garbage so they can have family meals. Okay? Picture that. That's your meal every day was someone else's meal, and you're getting the leftovers. People have been born and grown up there on the garbage dump. Can you imagine the smell and the, uh, you know, the, how dangerous it is for little children? They have had their families, their children, their shacks, their garbage to eat, and they finish out their lives on this dump. And they die there without ever going anywhere else, even in the city of Manila. Some of these people born, raised, die on the dump. It's an astonishing thing. But Americans, some Americans also live on the garbage dump. They are missionaries, Christians who have chosen to leave their own country and communicate the love of Jesus Christ to people who otherwise would never hear it. This is amazing to me. People would leave what we have here in America to go and live on a garbage dump. But you know, then he points out this fact. Anderson says that amazing as it is, is not as amazing as a journey from heaven to earth. And that's what happened at Christmas. God became flesh. He chose to be a part of the human lineage, lineage despite the skeletons in his past, in, the, in his human past. There's grace in Christ's genealogy. Just the fact that he became human, despite all that background. Then let's reflect on the fact that there's grace in our genealogy, if we are God's children, Christians. Not only are there skeletons in Christ's closet, if you're honest, there's skeletons in your own closet too. Now maybe literally in your, in your not, not, not literally, okay, in your closet. If there are, don't invite me to your house. Okay? But figuratively speaking, if you go back in your family background, in my family background, okay, my parents couldn't make it today because it's snow, but I'll, 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 I'll make sure I'll, I'll let them know I've shared with this. But my, my family background from India, there was, you know, there was, um, uh, Opium smoking, drug dealing. My dad learned how to walk in prison, from the from the bars in prison. And there's a lot of things going. My grandfather died of opium stuff, right? and there's a lot of stuff in my background even, right? Maybe there's some stuff in your background. You're ashamed of it. Maybe you have mental illness. Maybe you have a bankruptcy. Maybe you have a a several you know, a, a father who had like six wives or something. We don't know. I don't know. I don't need to know. But despite what has gone on in your background, there's grace. You don't have to repeat it. You don't have to do what your ancestors did. Just because they had that whatever illness or whatever that, that failure and they, they were a liar, they were a thief, they were a murderer, doesn't mean you're going to get punished for it. Because there's grace. There's, there is a sense of suffering. The Bible says, you know, if you have a drunkard father, then the children suffer for it in some ways. But it's not because it's your sin. There's grace in our backgrounds. There's grace in our genealogy. But not only is there grace in, in your ancestors' background, there's grace in your background. If you're a Christian this morning, whatever you've done, if you've repented of your sins, you simply say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm wrong, you're right. There's forgiveness. And Christ is taking your sins on the cross and he's paid for them and he's given you grace. And, even, and the whole point of salvation is not only are you right with God, but also you don't have to feel guilty about that sin anymore. Matthew 1, verse 21, the last, uh, near the end of the chapter, he shall, she will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Every time you say Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means, is a Hebrew version of, I'm sorry, the Greek version of the Hebrew Joshua, which means God saves. He has saved you. He has forgiven you. 
That there is grace in your genealogy as well. And that's why you should remember as you're reading the genealogy, not only has God forgiven the, the Rahabs and the Tamars, He's forgiven the Teds and the Jims and the Jills and the Johns. No matter what you've done. I want to read you, it's a little lengthy, but I have a bit of time. And I, and I just, I, I, when I, the first time I read this recently, this story, this modern day allegory, by Walter w- Wangernan uh, Jr. And you may have heard it, it's very famous, it's called The Ragman. But if you've never heard it, I want to share with you what I think is one of the be- most beautiful pictures of our salvation and what Christ did for the cross for us. Picture yourself. Okay, he, he writes, I saw a strange sight. I stumbled upon a story most strange, like nothing in my life, my street sense and my sly tongue had ever prepared me for. Hush, child, hush now, and I'll tell it to you. Even before the dawn, one Friday morning, I noticed a young man, handsome and strong, walking the alleys of our city. He was pulling an old cart filled with clothes, both bright and new, and he was calling in a clear tenor voice, rags. In the old days, they, people used to sell rags, um, clothing, for, to, to, for people to use. Okay? Ah, the air was foul, and the first light filthy to be crossed by such sweet music. Rags, new rags for old, I take your tired rags, rags, Now this is a wonder, I thought to myself, for the man stood six feet four, and his arms were like tree limbs, hard and muscular, and his eyes flashed intelligence. Could he find no better job than this to be a ragman in the inner city? You know, in those days, that's the worst job, right? I followed him, my curiosity drove him, and I wasn't disappointed. Soon the ragman saw a woman sitting on her back porch. She was sobbing into a handkerchief, sighing, and shedding a thousand tears. Her knees and elbows made a sad X. Her shoulders shook. Her heart was breaking. The ragman stopped his cart. Quietly, he walked to the woman, stepping around tin cans, dead toys, and and pampers. Give me your rag, he said gently, and I'll give you another. He slipped the handkerchief from her eyes. She looked up, and he laid across her palm a linen cloth so clean and new that it shined. She blinked from the gift to the giver. Then, as he began to pull his cart again, the ragman did a strange thing. He put her stained handkerchief to his own face. And then he began to weep to sob so grievously as she had done, his shoulders shaking. Yet she was left without a tear. This is a wonder, I breathed to myself, and I followed the sobbing ragman like a child who cannot turn away from mystery. Rags, rags, new rags for old. In a little while, when the sky showed gray behind the rooftops, and I could see the shredded curtains hanging out black windows, the ragman came upon a girl whose head was wrapped in a bandage, whose eyes were empty. Blood soaked her bandage. A single line of blood ran down her cheek. Now the tall ragman looked upon this child with pity, and he drew a lovely yellow bonnet from his cart. Give me a rag, he said, tracing his own line on her cheek, and I'll give you mine. The child could only gaze at him while he loosened the bandage, removed it, and tied it to his own head, the bonnet he set on hers. And I gasped when I, at what I saw, for with the bandage went the wound. But against his brow, it ran a darker, more substantial blood, his own. Rags, rags, I take old rags, cried the sobbing, bleeding, strong, intelligent ragman. The sun hurt now, both the sky and my eyes. The ragman seemed more and more to hurry. Are you going to work? He asked a man who leaned against the telephone pole. The man shook his head. The ragman pressed him, do you have a job? 
Are you crazy? sneered the man, the other man. He pulled away from the pole, revealing the right sleeve of his jacket. It was flat, the cuff stuffed into his pocket. He had no arm. So, said the ram man, give me your jacket, and I'll give you mine. So much quiet authority in his voice. The one-armed man took off his jacket. So did the ragman. And I trembled at what I saw. For the ragman's arm stayed in its sleeve. And when the other put it on, he had two good arms, thick as tree limbs. But the ragman now only had one. Go to work, he said. After that, he found a drunk lying unconscious beneath his army blanket, an old man hunched, wizened, and stick. He took that blanket and wrapped it around himself, but for the drunk, he gave him new clothes. And now I had to run to keep up with the ragman, though he was weeping uncontrollably and bleeding freely at the forehead, pulling his cart with one arm, stumbling for drunkenness, falling again and again, exhausted, old, and sick. Yet he went with terrible speed. On spider's legs he skittered through the alleys of the city, this mile and the next, until he came to its limits, and then he rushed beyond. I wept to see the change in this man. I heard to see his sorrow. And yet I needed to see where he was going in such haste, because perhaps I wanted to know what, what drove him so. Now this little old magman, he came to a landfill. He came to the garbage pits. And I wanted to help him in what he did, but I hung back hiding. He climbed a tree, a hill. With tormented labor, he cleared a little space on that hill. Then he sighed, and he lay down. He pillowed his head on a handkerchief and a jacket. He covered his bones with an army blanket. And then he died. Oh, how I cried to witness that death. I slumped in a junked car and wailed and mourned as one who has no hope. Because I'd come to love that ragman. Every other face had faded in the wonder of this man, and I cherished him, but he died. I sobbed myself to sleep. I did not know, how could I know, that I slept through Friday night and Saturday and its night too. But then on Sunday morning, I wakened violently. Light, pure, hard, demanding light slammed against my sour face. I blinked and I looked, and I saw the finest wonder of all. There was the ragman folding the blanket most carefully, a scar on his forehead, but alive. And besides that, he was healthy. There was no sign of sorrow or age. And all the rags that he had gathered shined for cleanliness. Well, then I lowered my head, and trembling for all that I had seen, I myself walked up to the ragman. I told him my name with shame, for I was a sorry figure next to him. Then I took off my clothes in that place, and I said to him with dear yearning in my voice, Dress me. And he dressed me. My Lord, he put new rags on me, and I'm a wonder beside him, the ragman the Christ. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Have you been saved by the ragman? Are you a Christian this morning? Have you given him your pain? Have you given him your sorrow? Have you given him your hurt? If you have... You're a child of his. He's taken it. And there's grace in your genealogy. You've got a story to tell. You've got a story to tell. There's grace in Christ's genealogy. There's grace in your genealogy. And there's grace even not just the past, but in your life today. Because God works through brokenness amidst the dust and despair of everyday life. He's evident, evident in dysfunction, in pain, in being outside, in having a past, 
in knowing you're undeserving. God knew how much pain you would go through. He allowed you to go through it, but then he purposely saved you so that now you can be a testimony of his grace to a painting, a painful, hurting world. Because, you know, when you see someone who's hurt, hurting someone else, it's most likely because they've been hurt themselves. Hurt people hurt people. Unforgiven people will never forgive others. But forgiven people can forgive others. Loved people can love others. People who know they've been given grace can give grace to others. When you experience God's grace, you will be a man or a woman of grace. That's how you prepare for Christmas. You know, in this world, in this, you know, all you got to do is just walk out the door and try to drive home and try pausing for a few seconds at a, red, at a green light and you'll realize there's no grace in this world. You'll hear it from the car behind you. Someone wrote um, recently um, about how we have an epidemic of anger. According to a USA Today study, this is American, but I think it matches with Canadians. Americans, the share of Americans who report feeling angry or irritable has surged from 50% just two years ago to 60% today. Last two years, 10% more Americans are angry. A Harvard medical study from 2012 to last year found that nearly two-thirds, two out of every three people, um, admit to having anger attacks involving the destruction of property, threats of violence, or engaging in violence. Two out of three people you meet on the street have, had some, have done some violent act recently. I, I, you know, it, it just comes out of nowhere, doesn't it? The other day I was putting uh, my recycling away. <laughs> And the recycling bin hit me in the head. <laughs> uh, I just, it, it just it was dumb. I got angry at the bin. <laughs> I, got, I was banging against the wall. <laughs> and, I, and then later I thought, where'd that come from? <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of in, there's things inside of, of people's lives. And, but you know, the Bible says, Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, there did grace much more abound. If you read the Old Testament, you know sin abounded <laughs> in, the, in the history of the Jews. Left, right, and center. But the whole story of the genealogy and, our, and the whole, and what we want to remember as we get ready for Christmas is that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And as you've been forgiven, you can forgive others. You need to recognize how much you've been forgiven. Luther said, sin boldly. Okay, what does that mean? Luther is, oh, that, that reformer, you know, Martin Luther, not the black guy, not Martin Luther, uh, but the other guy, the reformer, right? And he said, sin boldly. What does he mean? He wants you to encourage you to sin more. No. His point was this. If you're going to sin, just recognize, just recognize it, there's no such thing as a little sin. Every sin is a bold sin. And recognize that you're forgiven of that sin. So when you wake up in the morning, you don't have to feel guilty. When you go to sleep at night, you don't have to go to sleep guilty. When you confess your sins, it's forgiven. It's forgiven. Despite your addictions, your habits, your failures, despite what you did last night, you've asked for forgiveness, it's forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. That's grace. And then you recognize that. You can express that grace to others because you've been forgiven so much. There's grace in Christ's genealogy. There's grace in our genealogy. And there's grace in our lives today. Finally, there ought to be grace in our church today. Look at the, the rest of that chapter, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 20. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, Just like all of us. Oh, my friend did this to me. Oh, okay, I better do something about it. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Would Jesus, who was born to an illegitimate situation, considered a, uh, I don't want to use the term out loud, but someone who is not legitimate, did you hear that 
they were engaged at Joseph and Mary. And if you look, work out when Jesus is born, she conceived him before they were, mar- they were married. Did you hear that? Can you imagine the tongues wagging in first century Jerusalem? Would Jesus have been accepted in the synagogue? Would Jesus be accepted at North Toronto Chinese Baptist Church? You heard about that guy? You know what he did? You heard about his background? You know what he did at work? You know what that girl did? You know, you know how many guys she's married? Do you know how many... And it goes on and on and on. Look at those tattoos and that guy coming in. He smells, he reeks of smoke. That guy's drunk. What's he doing coming to church? She's a lesbian. He believes, he doesn't even believe in the Trinity. On and on. Would they be, would they feel comfortable walking in? He doesn't look like us. She doesn't look like us. Is there grace in our church? Is there grace in our church? You know, um, uh, there was a big conference, religious conference, uh, scholarly conference, and they were all debating about what is the, the, the one mark of Christianity that distinguishes it from all other religions. And someone brought up the fact that all those miracles that happened in the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? And someone else brought up the fact that there's a resurrection. And they were debating on and on for hours. And then uh, C.S. Lewis was in this conference, and he came in a bit early. He got, he's got settled in in his tweed jacket, and he's smoking a pipe. And, and he's hearing this, and he heard, what's this all ruckus about? And he said, oh, we're trying to debate what is the one identifying mark of Christianity. And Lewis simply said, oh, it's, a, it's easy. It's grace. We are the people of grace. We're not like a, you know, he, he, said, he said, Christianity is unique because we claim God's love comes free of charge, no strings attached. No other other religion makes that claim. That's too simple. But then someone else said, holy, that's right, look at those Hindus. They have that karma thing where you have actions continually affect the way the the world treats you. You do it to someone else, it comes back to you. And those Buddhists, they have that eightfold path to enlightenment. So it's not a free ride for a Buddhist. And the people from Islam, the Muslims, they've got their five pillars, even the Jewish people, they have this strict thing that you've got to do these things if you're going to be saved. That's right. Christians, we say it's free. It was costly. It cost Jesus his life. But it's free. It's grace. How do you prepare for Christmas? Be a man and woman of grace. Recognize there's grace in Christ's genealogy. There's grace in your genealogy. There's grace in your life today. And there ought to be grace in our church. I see it. So many, I'm, I'm so thankful. I wish I had more than like an hour to talk about all the things that God's doing here. The grace he shows. And, well, when you'll see 30 people getting baptized next Sunday in the afternoon, each of them, I, I just finished reading their testimony, each of them is a story of grace. Watch, come this Friday when we have a worship service and, and, you'll, and you'll experience grace as we sing together and sing of God's mercy to us. People singing yesterday at a, at a, at a caroling at, at an old folks home, that's grace. People giving to the Philippines. We gave over, what's the number? Um, uh, $17,000 to the Philippines, which equals, I think, 34 something thousand dollars doubled by the government. And I know some of you people, you know, um, they gave us a list of who gave, okay? And I, 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 didn't, I didn't, by the way, I don't know exactly who, but I, I saw a lot of words anonymous. All these people giving anonymously. And, and th- there's going to be $34,000 worth of grace given to the Philippines because God's working in your lives. Let's be a people of grace. And that's how we prepare for Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we